This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Get access to my streaming video service Nebula when you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in the description. After five seasons with the Mercedes team alongside Lewis Hamilton, Valtteri Bottas is leaving for the crimson lands of Alfa Romeo at the end of the year. Lewis Hamilton called him his best ever teammate, and Mercedes said he would well have deserved to continue racing with them, and have repeatedly lauded his work for the team. In many ways, he was the ideal candidate for that particular seat. But now George Russell is finally being promoted to the works Mercedes team, a move we were never entirely sure would happen, so enamoured Mercedes were with Bottas. So let's look back at Bottas's time with the team and cast some broad strokes over his performance with the best team on the grid. We can compare Valtteri's results directly against Lewis during the 91 races between Bottas's debut with the team in Australia 2017 and the Dutch Grand Prix 2021. Now I'm aware this video is coming out after the Italian Grand Prix, but this video took longer than I thought and the season is all crammed together. Nonetheless, 92 races, 91 races, it's not much of a difference, despite the fact that Bottas had the weekend of his season in Italy. Starting with their qualifying performances then, if we look at this bar chart here, we can see how many times each driver was classified in each particular position. Now I don't think anyone will be surprised to see Hamilton chose a clear advantage over Bottas. Hamilton scores a pole far and away more than any other result on Saturdays. Or sometimes on a Friday, I guess. Sprint qualifying really messes things up like this for people who like clean statistics. 45% of Hamilton's qualifying efforts have ended in pole position during his time alongside Bottas, with a further quarter of times resulting in second on the grid. He scores 13 thirds, 4 fourths, and only 8 times was he off the front two rows. Bottas, meanwhile, took pole less than a fifth of the time, but was very strong for second and third, taking the second two slots on the grid over half of the time. And if you look at their average positions, Lewis's mean quality result was just 2.48, with Bottas only 7 tenths of position behind on 3.18. So if Mercedes did just need someone to back up Lewis's title challenge, Bottas was doing just what they needed. And this is something we will get back to, don't you worry. And we can compare this Hamilton-Bottas partnership against others, like Hamilton and Rosberg, his former teammate at Mercedes. They raced together for 78 races from 2013 to 2016, the last three of those seasons being the beginning of Mercedes' dominance. Over that time, Hamilton took pole 47% of the time and second 27% of the time, incredibly comparable to his performance against Bottas. But Rosberg was on the front row much more than Bottas. 74% of the time compared to a 45% success rate from Bottas. This front row hit rate is almost identical to Hamilton's 76% across the same period. And interestingly, due to his strong consistency, Rosberg edges Hamilton on mean performance, a 2.42 in qualifying compared to Hamilton's 3.24. These two really were close, often to anxiety-inducing levels for Mercedes. The distribution of Bottas's qualifying results against Hamilton are shaped more similarly to those of Weber against Vettel during their 94 race partnership across five seasons at Red Bull, which included four years of double championship wins. Through this incredibly strong era for Red Bull, Vettel had an astonishing pole position hit rate, with 44 poles to Weber's 12, and an average qualifying position two places higher than Weber. Looking at these results, Weber did very much sit in that number two seat, perhaps more than he never liked to admit. Bottas holds up a little bit stronger in this regard. And the other, slightly different pairing I'd like to look at was Max Verstappen at Red Bull versus the amalgamated statistics of everyone he's been paired with. So I've glommed Ricardo, Gasly, Albon and Perez into the other driver across 109 races that Verstappen has been at Red Bull. And there's a big difference here as Red Bull hasn't been the dominant package of this era, so Max's qualifying performance is centred around 3rd, 4th, 5th places, with his teammate generally a little worse off. But I wanted to bring this partnership into play as Red Bull have this ongoing second driver dilemma as they search endlessly for the perfect partner for Max, while Mercedes have been extremely happy with Bottas sitting alongside Hamilton. So we'll be looking more into this pairing too as we continue to illustrate some performances. If we get rid of this chart now and look at direct quality head-to-heads, that is how many times one driver outscores the other in quality, Lewis beat Valtteri fairly robustly 59-28 to across all of their qualifyings where they both reached the same session. That's more than two-thirds of the time. Now we can split this across their seasons to see this is fairly consistent year on year, though Hamilton has taken a bigger chunk this year as he's upped the ante to focus on beating Verstappen. And if we look at pole positions, Lewis has taken the lion's share every year, except for 2019 where Bottas matched him 5 for 5. 
2019 did seem like a year where Bottas was stepping up his game, but it never quite reached that level. But beating Hamilton one third of the time in qualifying isn't that bad, really, when you consider Vettel and Hamilton's teammates only managed it a quarter of the time. Only Rosberg came close to Hamilton, out-qualifying him not quite half the time. But did Merck really want another Hamilton-Rosberg battle? Or did Bottas represent the strong but demonstrably less quick driver more suited to managing the team's efforts as a whole? For more on that, let's put qualifying aside now and look at race results in much the same way across the same periods. And we can see again the tremendous win rate Hamilton has pulled over the last 91 races in comparison to Bottas. Lewis has grabbed a win in 51% of the races they've contested together. Bottas, in comparison, has only won 10%, with 9 victories, but again has a high hit rate for 2nd and 3rd place. Half of his results fall on the lower steps of the podium, which, you know, is probably exactly what Mercedes wants from him. But Hamilton, on average, is finding 2.4 places over Bottas in race results, which is a not insignificant gap. That's the kind of gap that could worry Mercedes, as that's where their rivals can park themselves and gain much needed points, instead of having Bottas hold them back. And of the races where they've both finished, of which there are 82, Bottas ended up 808 seconds behind Hamilton in total, an average close to 10 seconds per race, meaning there were a fair number of races where Bottas was too far away to play the wingman role and apply pressure to rival drivers. And we'll get to that in a bit. Nico Rosberg had a much stronger bag of results than Bottas, hitting first and second with extreme consistency, 59% of the time. That's more than Lewis's 57% across the same era, and much more than Bottas's 40% during his time at Mercedes. Nico was only half a position behind Lewis on average. But Bottas grabs better race positions than Weber did against Vettel. Weber was a lot less consistent, partly down to the fact that his Red Bull wasn't quite as reliable as the bulletproof Mercs of the last years. And obviously the Verstappen era is less skewed towards wins as the others, but you can see his hump of results is markedly higher than his teammates, and he finishes one position higher than them. Which is actually not too bad a showing from the other drivers, considering how much Red Bull have been agonising over them. Switching back to Bottas, across his 91 races, Hamilton beat him in races 68 times, or 75% of their shared results. Again, this year has been particularly bad for Bottas, having only beaten Hamilton twice up to Zandvoort. And we could directly compare this to 2018, another season where Hamilton was genuinely focused on fighting drivers outside of his own team. In this case, Vettel and Ferrari put up a real title fight and Bottas found himself completely squeezed out of the party. Rosberg, as you might expect, held stronger against Hamilton, beating him 42% of the time. Again, not quite half the races, but a respectable challenge that was evident across their three championship battles. But Bottas's efforts to beat Lewis race on race are worse than Weber managed against Vettel and those against Verstappen's teammates who all managed to outrace their superstar partners more than one quarter of the time. Now as a caveat, Merck's aforementioned hyper-reliability and Hamilton's minimal retirement rate has given Bottas less of an opportunity to overcome the odds than perhaps the others might have managed. In terms of outright wins, Bottas has only bagged 16% of the team victories, a statistic not helped by his complete lack of wins in 2018. Now he also has no wins thus far in 2021, but then Hamilton isn't overflowing with them either, yet. But again, in years where Mercedes are fighting off external forces, Bottas's results disappear as rival teams and drivers fill the gap he leaves to Hamilton. For all the talk from Mercedes of Hamilton and Bottas being equal drivers, it is clear Valtteri is loved in the team for the strong support role he plays. And you have to say it is a role he's brought on himself for all his hatred of being called a wingman or so such. If he could challenge Hamilton for poles and wins and titles more often than he has, then he almost certainly would have been allowed to, just as Rosberg did for all the headaches that that brought. But it's well suspected that Merck have loved keeping him on board for the very reason that he's a strong, decent driver, but not a rival to Hamilton. Not enough to consistently cause grief. He's well placed so that Mercedes can manage their campaign in a streamlined, Hamilton-focused way. Bottas's 16% win rate pales to Rosberg taking 41% of Merck's wins, but is closer to Weber's 19% and the other Red Bull driver taking 23% of their wins, situations with much more clear secondary drivers results-wise. And in terms of total points scored across their partnerships, all of Bottas, Rosberg, Weber and the other Red Bull driver scored between 50 and 60% of their team's points, which is what you want really, isn't it? There's nothing shameful in that. Now you can't ignore that the Hamilton-Bottas partnership has yielded four drivers' titles and four constructors' titles, all in Hamilton's favour of course, and that Mercedes have achieved all of this with a lot less aggro than they did across the Hamilton 
Rosberg years. And this is all well and good when you've had the good fortune, yeah, and skill, to race from the position of dominance that Mercedes has enjoyed. But once external pressures come into play, like Ferrari in 2018 and Red Bull in 2021, they need their second driver to maximise their points haul, block out the higher positions, and be in a decent position during the race to apply pressure to their rivals. And this doesn't just mean fighting with and overtaking the rival cars on track, but by being close enough to the action to allow Mercedes to play strategically. If Bottas is close to a Max Lewis fight, then he can scare Red Bull into pitting early by coming in to scoop the undercut. You can't spook your rival into abandoning their ideal strategy if you're too far behind to come into play, and that leaves Merck fighting single-handedly and hoping Perez, or whoever, isn't close enough to throw their own spanner into the works. And so enters George Russell. Now with Russell, Merck have brought two key elements to bear. The first, they think they can squeeze more performance out of that second seat. Now there are definitely still some question marks over Russell. He's pulled some incredible performances out of his Williams, particularly in qualifying, and showed tremendous form in his one-off sub-in for Mercedes last year, nearly winning in a car he didn't even fit in properly. But he doesn't have strong racecraft record in F1, mostly because he hasn't been in a position to demonstrate it. His superstar qualifying performances have faded on Sundays when Williams, for the most part, could not keep up the fight over a race, at least not until very recently. And he certainly hasn't had to run the kind of races Mercedes run from the front, with the pressure of poles, wins, championships on his shoulders. Not since his Formula 2 days, and F1 is a whole different kettle of fish. He's going to have to elevate himself in that Mercedes seat and be the driver the hype expects of him. He's definitely a top-tier driver, but now he has to deliver it every weekend against the best. But do Mercedes want him to be too close to Lewis? If George is challenging for wins and poles on the reg, that will put Merck in an uneasy position that they had in the Rosberg years. Especially if their dominant days are over and they're having to fight off Red Bulls and maybe even McLarens, Ferraris and who knows who else in 2022. That's already a year of big question marks. But look, it is better to have two strong drivers fighting for the maximum possible results than one supreme driver and another who may not be there when it counts. And with that comes the second key element George brings. A look to the future. Mercedes have to look beyond Lewis Hamilton. He's one of the oldest drivers on the grid, and talk of his retirement has been circulating for the last few contract rounds. Now he's locked down till 2023, but after that, well who knows? We're definitely at the tail of his F1 career either way. Elsewhere, teams have been firmly planting seeds to bear fruit for the next generation. Max at Red Bull, Leclerc at Ferrari, Norris at McLaren, all promising young drivers grabbed early in order to develop them for the big things to come. If Mercedes didn't get a hot young driver in to nurture and develop firsthand for the next era, then they could very easily be left empty-handed at the wrong moment. If Lewis hadn't renewed his contract this year, for example, they would have had to parachute someone in to fill some very heavy boots at the last minute. Would a Russell Bottas 2022 pairing be up for a full on title assault? It would have been a very big ask. So farewell then, Valtteri Bottas from Mercedes. You were, for the most part, exactly what the team needed to reach their goals. Race winner and pole sitter, but crucially, not a title contender. A strong, talented racer, but not a threat. May you thrive at Alfa Romeo, free to be the very best that you can be. If you enjoyed this video, you could have seen it ad-free on Nebula, a streaming platform put together by a large team of creators like me to stretch our legs a little bit away from some of the confines of YouTube. Nebula is home to some of my favourite educational, analytical and expertise you will creators like Philosophy Tube, Nando V Movies and Legal Eagle, who not only showcase their videos ad-free, but often include extended cuts or entire episodes and series entirely exclusive to Nebula. And that's because Nebula isn't beholden to chasing the dreaded algorithm, so creators are free to just make the great content they really believe in and that you love to watch. So the fun part is Nebula have teamed up with CuriosityStream. Now, CuriosityStream is a massive streaming platform with thousands of superb documentaries and educational series like Wild Weather with Richard Hammond, in which the tiny Top Gear man crosses the globe to explore extreme meteorological wildness across our weird planet. There is a lot of cool stuff on CuriosityStream, and if you go and sub to CuriosityStream, you will get Nebula completely free. 
not just for a month or whatever, but free as long as you're signed up to CuriosityStream. And if you sign up via the link in the description, curiositystream.com slash chainbear, you'll get 26% off the annual plan, which just amounts to $14.79 for the whole year, for both platforms together. It really is a great package. And of course, by signing up, you'll also be supporting me and the other great independent creators. And you get to see a whole lot of cool stuff. So go check it out. <laughs>